Andy goes next door and opens up those double doors, and there's a stash of over a thousand boxes of pre-embargo Cubans. So if you had bought, you know, uh, a stash, a uh, hundred thousand dollars stash of Cubans, you'd have over eight hundred thousand, nine hundred thousand dollars worth. He's not a good guy. He's uh, he's uh, known to be very bad. I've got about five hundred boxes of cigars from the late 1800s to the mid 50s. They have a museum and I've donated a few of their clear vinyl boxes <laughs> with cigars. Wow. When you're donating to the guys that made them, that's pretty. That's a pretty impressive flag. We're here with a very exclusive, very special, exclusive, right? You haven't talked to anyone else, right? No. Okay, we're here with, you may not have ever heard of him because we just met him yesterday uh, by way of Pete Johnson. Thank you, Pete. Uh, Frank Baruti, who happens to be a specialist in vintage whiskeys and liquors and cigars and he has one of the most renowned collection of pre-embargo cuban cigars frank how you doing man real good it's good to be here happy to be in vegas always because it's the only time that uh, all the industry people are there and we uh, kind of all meet and greet and you know share the love and passion <laughs> yeah. so you you pretty much told us like ask me how i got into cigars and i'll take it from there so i i've read that you started collecting as a teenager is that true uh freshman year first semester at usc so i was a little bit uh, that was 1976 so i was born in 58 yeah so um you do the math but uh, in any case i went to a, a privileged college in uh, in los angeles called the university of southern california where there's three types of people that get in that university uh, typically they're either fabulous athletes um, they uh, know how to uh, uh, take the the budget that the parents uh, uh, have substantial substantial funds there because it was a very expensive college uh, born with a platinum spoon in the mouth so to speak or guys that knew how to take tests really good yeah. Yeah, I knew how to take tests really good so I had a full ride there and I went to school for engineering and uh, my roommate for semester of freshman year uh, was a guy by the name of Dale Norris and uh, we were two peas in a pod same size height build background except for he got a shit ton of money and I came from a real modest family um, but uh, one day after about three months of being roommates um, he was putting on a tuxedo and I said, what's with the penguin suit? And he goes, don't you worry about that. I'm just attending a service for my grandfather. He just passed. I'm going, Jesus, I'm sorry. He goes, no, 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 don't be sorry. Um, after when I come back, we'll go and uh, I'll, I'll share with you what he left me. I was, was kind of scratching my head. I said, okay, all right, works. So a couple hours, three hours later, he comes back and said, okay, let's go. He got changed. We uh, hopped in his little hot rod and we went uh, from downtown L.A., which is where USC is, to... Um, kind of like the Beverly Hills of Pasadena called San Marino. And after just a 20 minute drive, we pull up to this driveway that you can't even see the end of with 200 year old pine trees and just fabulous grounds. And then we come to a, about a 40,000 square foot home that's just plopped in the middle of it all. And it was like a magical castle to me. Uh, and he goes, ah, you've not, not seen anything yet. <laughs> so we go around the back and the pool house and the giant pool in the backyard is a three or four acre spread. And he says, let's go down and uh, to the basement where I want to put my music studio. I'm going, so you're going to take over this? He goes, yeah, it's fine. I said, very cool. Uh, it's a selective breeding where it really works. They're, they're right about it. Uh, so we went down to the, the basement, and then uh, there's these two sets of doors that are about nine feet high and, and double wides. And he grabs these giant keys off one of the doors and opens up the twin doors. And there's a mind-boggling collection of 40,000 first-growth wines. And I didn't know much. I mean, Lancers and, and uh, Blue Nun and, you know, that was more like the college stuff. But I don't even know what first growth means. For the, the, the premier, premier uh, French Bordeaux's okay. and, and Burgundy's. And uh, they started with the 1929 vintage and then the, then the 45 and the 61, which are all legendary 100-point 100, 100 vintages. So somebody knew how to procure this stuff and was probably maybe a touch alcoholic. But uh, 82s weren't out, which is the, the premiere that was next to come after our, the time that we were there. And I just was mind-boggled. 
And he goes, ah, there's another room cool that's cool too. I go, oh, fuck, I'm, I'm happy with what, what I'm seeing here. And he goes next door and opens up those double doors. And there's a stash of over a thousand boxes of pre-embargo Cubans wow. from the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And that's how I got first introduced to cigars and high-end alcohol. You started cigars with the most elusive cigars. Uh, in the world. Yeah. Crazy shit. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't happen. Like today, most people get into cigars through acid or something like that. Right. You started with yeah. things collectors would die for. Oh, yeah. There's, uh, you know, they're all hen's teeth. <laughs> yeah. And what I really fall, fell in love with, I wasn't a smoker at all, but of course we had to try this stuff because we knew it was rare and along, try to match the 1929 vintage with the 1929 Bordeaux's, you know, to do a little, you know, uh, vertical or horizontal tastings. And uh, what I, I started to fall in love with the, the cigar label art of those boxes. So real intricate, um, 17 different uh, layers of, of colors. And, and uh, I ended up starting collecting the art for that but I also started looking everywhere for these kind of cigars back and that was in 1976 yeah. uh, and also the pre-prohibition whiskey um, was was also a part of that collection of the booze and I, I loved the, the labels and the artwork of that so I started collecting both of those things uh, when they weren't quite as expensive as they are now yeah so yeah. so how Oh, so many questions. So, are you, are you still actively collecting? Are you still are you still able to find pre-embargo? I'm a certifiable uh, treasure hunter, and I call it treasures when I'm looking. And I look all around the world for this stuff. I mean, if I get a phone call, my name is sort of out there in, in a number of circles. And if I get a phone call from from Italy or Spain or or London or a lot, a lot more Europe than any place else. Um, I'll hop on a plane. If they describe it and show me some photos that makes me think it's worthwhile, you got to get the next flight out there before somebody else hears about it. Wow, that's, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> and I've done that for, yeah, 30, 30, 40 years. Wow. So, how... <sighs> Again, I don't even know what to ask. This is, this is like a deep breath. It's all this is like a whole new world to me. Oh, no, so, not too many people can share this. So, to me, pre-embargo Cubans were just like a thing of the past. They didn't even exist anymore. Now I'm learning like there's people still collecting them out there. Small stashes. Yeah, I mean it is a smokable product, so um, they're uh, pockets of opportunity. A lot of the the British British wealth and some royalty in Spain and so forth and from generations back that were buying these things and just storing them and every once in a while one of those people passes and then the wife's the the, the grand granddaughter's husband or wife or whatever doesn't know what to do with them and they make a phone call or two yeah and uh that's what we really like yeah i was gonna say <laughs> uh have you ever gotten a deal where you're just walking away feeling guilty because it was such a good deal several yeah yeah you're just this guy's like had no idea what he has yeah but i you know i do my best to to be fair because yeah. you know i i got to sleep with myself too so yeah yeah because like 10 years down the road that guy could be like oh my god i sold that for one tenth of the price well, 10 years ago that doesn't matter because that in in the cuban world right now two years ago if you had bought you know a, a stash a hundred thousand dollars stash of cubans you'd have over eight hundred thousand nine hundred thousand dollars worth of cigars so the guilt doesn't have to go that long yeah. but that's a whole different issue and uh, that may be another another interesting topic for another day <laughs> is, is there something about pre-embargo cubans that you just really enjoy that you can't find in other cigars today absolutely they uh, they're all they've had enough time to mellow all the all the different tobaccos uh, in the blends have have melded it, they tend to be really creamy and soft and delicate and you close your eyes and you're just you know if you've got a bottle of scotch or or whiskey from the same era you can just leave the planet for a while and it's uh it's really a romantic thing yeah yeah for i mean this is like child's play to you but for us we really loved the don pepin garcia 10th anniversary limited edition we got as many boxes as we could and we paired it with ichiro's chichibu and for us 
like that was a very special day we didn't care what was going on it just changed the world for us right. so i can't imagine your level <laughs> well you know I, I in in hong kong and and a few other choice places around the world london um a lot of times i you know, i'll take some of my pre-prohibition whiskeys from say the mid mid 20s and then dig up some box old boxes of partagas or names that people recognize and uh have 10, 10 guys that each maybe get their own pint of pre-prohibition whiskey. Uh, and all those are mostly dated. You know, it, it'll give you the production date and the bottle date. So, you know, it's, you know, if it's from 1914, bottled in 1930, you got a 16 year old whiskey there. Uh, no question about that. And if you're thinking, ah, some of these are fake, there's not a big enough market for people to fake the, these things. And just like pre-embargo cigars, they're not, we, we're not worried about, you know, fake Cohibas with glass tops or anything like that <laughs> yeah so but that the romance that goes into that and if you cater that with a really nice meal that's uh that's matched on on uh old you can tie some old vintage wines in there too it ends up being a, an experience that guys that have everything billionaires centimillionaires this is something that they've never done before so it takes a lot to come up with something that those kind of guys have never done before. And they'll talk about it for the rest of their freaking lives. Yeah. Yeah. I love doing that. Yeah. We were, we were just, you were just telling us how you were hanging out with a billionaire last night. And I don't know if you want to say his name on camera. Yeah, I okay. But you're hanging out with him last night. He's a billionaire. He can buy whatever he wants. So what's the one thing? You can only give him things that he can't get himself right. as a gift. And that's the cool thing. Yeah. He said, where the fuck is that? You know, I'm scared. Eh, you know, just uh, you know, in due course, we'll fire this thing up. Yeah, we fired up a, a super rare Dunhill nine inch A from the mid 80s, and uh, that's about as rare as hen, hen's teeth. That was, was bought in a, an auction in London for three thousand dollars for one stick. Uh -oh. So that's how stupid these tobacco uh, <laughs> games go. <laughs> if you really want to, and for him, you know, it's just like it was a gift for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so he, you know, he took me out to a nice dinner. <laughs> Is what's the most you've ever seen a cigar go for? Yeah, that would be it. That's, that's the most like expensive it. cigar I've I've ever seen, heard of, or touched. Well, guy that we're talking about, if you uh, watching this, that's the most expensive cigar he could ever give someone. Yeah, in fact, if you'd like to see what they look like. Absolutely. Well, uh, I just happen to have a box. We'll like film some B-roll of it. Oh, yeah, okay. show the camera. And what uh, these were from the mid-80s from Dunhill. And they come in their own little coffins. So Dunhill's not around anymore. No. So well, the, the, the uh, accessory company Dunhill is. Yeah. But um, actually, while we're at it, I guess we can pull one of these out and show the folks what uh, what... What a three thousand dollar cigar looks like. <laughs> How long ago did you get this this collection? I've had them forty years. Oh wow! So you probably sell this for a lot more at auction nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, they were a hundred dollars back then. Oh wow! Okay. This three hundred percent marked up. <laughs> wow. Three thousand. Three th three thousand percent. Yeah, <laughs> that <is> not strong. <laughs> that's okay. But anyway, that's uh, you know part of the rarefied earth that uh, most people have never seen. That makes my uh, treasure hunting uh, so much more fun. Yeah, is there an elusive cigar out there that you have yet to be able to find? Uh, nothing that's on my bucket list. This this would be you know on most people's bucket list. Uh, there's you know right now the the big names are are Dun Dunhill and uh, uh, Davidoff. And Davidoff are, are still, they're around. They made a lot of cigars. Um, now they're in the Dominican Republic, but, but um, uh, some of them are very, very good, and others are, you know, in, in 40, 40 years have lost their, their flavor and have just become fairly tasteless. But the bigger ring gauges, the ones that, actually the ones that have good aroma, you can smell these things, and if you smell something, then there's a darn good chance that you're going to be able to taste something. And if they smell like newspaper, um, you know, you might as well just, uh, you know, give it away. So there, there are some cigars out there that 
after enough time they just have nothing to them so you you have to be it can't just be like oh this is a hundred year old cigar as be that's a hundred year old cigar that will retain flavor no no and on top of that they have to have been stored properly um you know there's a certain tolerance but if they once a cigar gets too moist it's over they're yeah. just forget it if they get too dry not too too dry you can revive them without bursting uh, the the wrappers and so forth but you should do it in five five degree increments you know from 30 percent humidity to 35 and 40 45 50 and build it back up and uh, that way it'll, there's a good chance that you won't break the wrappers and you know they're fine for still have a, a smokable cigar oh. About so, if, say you found a really rare cigar, and it's at about thirty percent humidity. How long would you take to get it all the way back about up to a six? Week, a week for every five degrees. Okay. Yeah, just take your time. From the expert, I know a lot of people have been asking that question, and you you happen to be one of the most expert. Well. I just have been doing this yeah. for forty something years. <laughs> so, but still, that's that's a question a lot of people ask. Is like, hey, if my cigars dried out, you know, how do I revive it? If you do it too fast, it'll, the 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 wrappers will burst and they'll explode, and yeah. and then you won't get a draw, and it'll game over. So you, you can bring back an old cigar fairly quickly, a couple months. Sure. Yeah. So every five degrees or five percent yeah, every week. I recommend. I mean, there's you know there's other other guys that will say something different because they, you know, that's. After reviving a shit ton of yeah. <laughs> cigars, um, that's what I would say. Yeah. Okay. And then if they're too moist, they just get like molded on it. Yeah, they get mold, and once you get mold, it, the flavor's gone, and you might as well move on. Well, not just the flavor. You're smoking mold. That can't be healthy. <laughs> no, no, no. But so, how extensive is your collection right now? I've got about 500 boxes of cigars from the late 1800s to the mid 50s. Who was making cigars in the 1800s? A lot, a lot of really old boxes are out there, but most of them don't have cigars. Yeah, um, these were um, a lot of uh, uh, boxes that were, were called um, clear Havanas. You know, made in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and uh, were using Cuban tobacco. Um, but. Uh, a number of the the big big names were around in the the late 1800s. Yeah, that was uh, mostly out of Tampa. They're making them, right? Yeah, but but at one point there were thousands of factories uh, all all over the place. And I also collect old empty boxes. I've got probably a thousand of those. Yeah. Uh, and uh, some of the and I was collecting for the artwork. Um, because some of them are so so cool. Stone lithography uh, was a really really cool thing, uh, and um, you yeah, know a lot of a lot of brands uh, were were in the teens and in the twenties as well, and then and then the Great Depression in the tw in the twenties things dropped off. Yeah. So uh, what 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 dropped off in like the Great Depression? Production and all the all the all they, they stopped producing. Factories went out of business. Yeah. You know. The, the crash in 29 actually yeah, yeah. so just did uh, any cigar companies brave the weather and make it through or well guys like uh, like the Newmans I think uh, were were around yeah. but they, were they making clear Habanos yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, they have a museum, and I've donated a few of their clear Havana boxes really? <laughs> to, with cigars. <laughs> wow. When you're donating to the guys that made them, that's pretty. That's a pretty They're impressive friends. flex. We've known the, We've known. I've yeah, been around. I know all these guys for a long, long time. Yeah. Bobby Newman's total sweetheart. One of the nicest guys. And, and Eric is awesome. And Drew, I knew Drew when he was six years old. <laughs> you know. <so. laughs> wow. yeah. A lot of history in the cigar industry. What is something? That you think most people would never know about cigars that they should know. Oh. <laughs> like where to begin? Well, it depends on what level of person is asking that question. But uh, you know, the first thing on the top of my head is that that uh, I think they're, they're a preserver of of age and youth. You look at all all these guys that are now my age. I'm 65. Carlitos, uh, what 69. Uh, Bobby and uh, you know we're in our 50, 50s to 70s range and we all look pretty good in the face I mean we don't look our age so I would say um, people don't realize that tobacco somehow is a preservative <laughs> that, yeah. no we were um, we were talking 
Because Perdomo's uh, Nikki looks young. Yeah, you know, I mean uh, Pete is young. Well, no, they're 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 head of uh, sorting. It's ninety three year old Aristides. He's been in tobacco since he was ten years old. He has like an eight year old kid. <laughs> Oh, oh my! Yeah, the Latin's kind of. You know, they, and the same with the uh, Agonors, Agonorsa. The same, same thing. Ninety years old has a ten-year-old kid. Yeah, and they're you know somehow look at George Burns. He was smoking how many a day, and he died at a hundred and whatever. You know, um, so yeah, that would that would be one thing that people don't recognize. You know, I've always thought that, but I'm, I'm not an expert on it. So, oh, but the older these guys get, they're all my buddies. The older they look, they get, they we still all kind of look the same. Yeah, which is very unusual after twenty thirty years. Yes. <laughs> Actually, I think Carlito looks younger today than he did five years ago. Yeah, I, I worry about him, but but uh, you know, um, his his mind just is uh, formidable. <laughs> I just he doesn't know how to stop. But uh, yeah, no, he looks good. I think that's because the cigars are like a stress killer. So like stress kills cigars, kill stress. So and that's why we age less when we smoke. Yeah, no, that's 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 a decent theory. Yeah. And then maybe something to do with the actual tobacco. Yeah. yeah. And maybe the alcohol has something to do with it, too. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's a combination. So you, have, you have a pretty extensive alcohol collection, too. Yeah, really quite serious. I've been collecting those as long as the, as the cigars. What does a pre-embargo whiskey taste like? They're all bourbons, mm-hmm. first of all. So, but... Uh, some of them have very many, um, very much uh, of a similarity to the current good bourbons. Yeah, no, I mean it's they, they don't, they don't age anymore once, uh, you know, once they're bottled. Yeah. So there's not. I mean, if you can blind taste, um, you'll get nuances of flavors that uh, that you probably never had before. Um, but. Uh, the big thing is just the whole pomp and circumstance of opening up this this bottle that, that hasn't been opened for a hundred years, mm-hmm. you know, and taking the romance of taking whatever unique closures that these things have, and and just the, watching the eyes of your bros as you open these things, yeah. and getting the cool glasses and pour, seeing the whole the liquid. Yeah, it's just a romance, man. Yeah, it's really really uh, memorable though. And then you're tasting something that you've never tasted before, and you may love it, and you may think it's dog shit, but it's just like, um, you know, I always like to say in the wine business because I I make wine in Argentina as well, but. But uh, you can have a $2 bottle, a $20 bottle, a $200 bottle, a $2,000 bottle, or a $20,000 bottle. If you like that $2 bottle the best, it's the best one. Yeah. So there's, you, you know, you're not going to be wrong. You know, it's, that's what you like. It's your palate. So that's the same thing with cigars, and that's the same thing with the whiskeys as well. Yeah. I always blame my, my business partner because before I met him, I could drink a box wine and be really happy. And then he introduced me some really nice wines. I was like, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My wallet's hurting a lot since I met him. Yeah, and just think about that that cellar that I walked into when I was a freshman year, first semester at SC, and going twenty nine. Shit, <laughs> not a lot of box wine in your future. <laughs> no, no, no. We accelerated quite past yes, that, yeah, you know, quite so. rapidly. Yeah. What else can you tell us that you know uh, our audience is you know we go towards the new smokers, the twenty five to thirty five year old smokers. What's something that you could tell them about cigars? First of all, that you know most of the the new production stuff needs a good, in my opinion, five years if it's of quality. Okay. It needs a good five years before all the all the components meld into what was really intended to be made. Okay. Um, it's actually a, a very controversial topic again among the newer generation of smokers. Uh, a lot of them say, after five years, it tastes like air. Don't age your cigars. Well, they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. The guys that say that, good luck. <laughs> That's just you know, just like the Cubans now, uh, or the sorry, the, the Chinese that are buying the the Cohibas, and they want them the fresher, the fresher the better. Wow. Uh, yeah. If it's one year old, it's like wait a minute, this is old. It's been sitting on the shelf. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think we all know better than that. But um, you know the the uh, you know the new new world cigars are are encroaching on the on the classic Cuban territory for a good number of reasons. Um, not the least of which is that Cuba is just so messed up. 
uh, you know, in terms of even having the people to roll the product. You know, all the best rollers are trying to get out of the country, and, and a lot of them have. And and being cursed with the terrible weather that's over there, that all the, the crops that have been just destroyed year after year, yeah. f- frequently uh, in the last ten years. Um, and then not having enough money to buy the fertilizer, you know, to really stimulate the growth, and using and retilling the, the same the same earth that uh, doesn't have the nutrients that it really needs. Um, so, uh, you know, that you're not having that problem in Nicaragua, and certainly not in in uh, the biggest producing countries in in uh, Latin America. Yeah. So. Um, so the future looks bright for the, you know, for the, uh, the new world cigars. Yeah. And, and people are disgusted with the, the prices of, of uh, the, the Habanos. I mean, I, I live in Cambodia now and the guy that, uh, put together the deal for Habanos and Altidus lives 15 minutes away and he's a Chinese guy. Doesn't know his ass from a hole in the ground when it comes to tobacco, uh, Yet he's he's got his guys going out and trying to buy up all the older stuff because he does know that the older stuff is is uh, more 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 smokable and more valuable only because his minions tell him that. Yeah, um, sounds like you, you have a high opinion of this guy. <laughs> uh, he, he's not a good guy. He's uh, he's uh, known to be very bad. Uh, very very bad you can do your own research on that but he's he's not allowed to go back to China and he paid Cambodia a lot of money to set up shop there and I'll leave it at that but uh, so I think uh, in the other part of the world that you guys probably don't know that much about uh, including Europe and and particularly the the uh, Far East and and, uh, and Southeast Asia people are I don't know how long those prices can be sustained. Yeah. You know, when, when I'm five years ago, I buy a, a box of uh, Cohiba Talisman for $232 in Havana. And now the going price is four to $6,000 for that same box of 10 cigars. Wow. Come on. It's, you know, they, we know how much a cigar costs to make. We do. Right. Yeah. You know, give it two to three dollars tops tops. And that's if you're doing everything right. And, you know, and here we are. Uh, the latest, uh, the latest 55th anniversary Cohiba um, uh, an- anniversary uh, Victoria came on the market less than a year ago for $300 retail per stick, boxes of 10. So 3000 a box of 10. Within two months, uh, when the Chinese guy said, now PCC, which is uh, Pacific Cigar, you know about those guys? Mm-hmm. They're the biggest distributor for Southeast Asia. They've got about 18 countries that they distribute and have their own shops. So it's kind of like their own monopoly. Yeah. They sell themselves, and it's a, it's a really interesting deal. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, they, they now were proclaimed to be the ones that set the price for Cuban cigars for the world. Wow. So within two months of the three hundred dollar ones, the price jumped to six hundred and forty dollars per box per box uh, of of ten. So sixty four hundred dollars. Yeah. Crazy. It's, and then and that that happened. Well, I luckily I stacked up on that stuff, so I'm pretty happy about it. But yeah. Um, but but I was just in Vietnam in the capital in Saigon uh, two weeks ago, where the taxes are about like they are in Thailand, which are some of the highest in, in Asia or the world. And they're now $1,100 a piece. So $11,000 for a box of 10. Wow. Still not what the Dunhill was. Yeah. Um, but uh, my God, how can that be sustained? You know, when you can buy, you know, a box of Pete stuff or, or Carlito's Rarest or whoever you want to go after, yeah. you know, whatever, whatever flavor profile you like for a fraction. Yeah. So anyway, w- w- I diverge, but nonetheless, it's, no, uh, no, it's the world that I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, that's the world I'm involved in. Yeah. You know? no, that's absolutely fascinating. Like I never even thought about the world of uh, Asian tobacco and I had no idea they had this monopoly on it. Like setting the price for Cuban cigars, that's ridiculous. Yeah. That, well, that's uh, the Chinese. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's their money. So, back, going back to aging, yeah. so you would recommend any, any new 
cigars coming out, whether they're from Cuba or Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, like let that sit for minimum five years. So, yeah. well, I mean, no, you can start smoking it. Well, you know, the thing to do is buy a box of box of twenty five, and every every three four months, try another one and see whether you know how how they're progressing. Yeah, and uh, keep doing that until they're hit the sweet sweet spot. Yeah, you know, some some will be uh, you know a year and a half. Some will be five, seven years. Some will be in in between there. But it's again, it's you. You're not going to be wrong. Yeah. You know, you don't don't need to listen to anybody else. Whatever you think is correct because that's what you think. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> People forget that. Oh no, but he says, you know, no. Wait a minute. If you like it, it's good. Yeah. So I was at a wedding and I was handed a my father cigar. And I couldn't remember which one it is, so I bought like three of all of them, <laughs> and uh, and I smoked them all and I hated them all. Huh. And I threw them in the humidor and I didn't touch them for about three years. And I pulled them out and I was like, "That's the cigar. That's they were all just as good as the one I had at that wedding." <laughs> Not hard to believe. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Pete. I know that's your family. <laughs> no, that's a. They build those to age too. I mean, obviously they want to drive sales and you know have everybody smoke everything, but. Down to get the real experience, you buy those on a on a repetitive basis. You put them away, and then you know, with with time, you go through them. Yeah, yeah. We're starting to collect more humidors than we are cigars now, because <laughs> just to keep them going. Yeah, well, it's it's a contagious and it's a it's a vicious cycle. It really is, because I don't. We don't even smoke our cigars like. We very, very often or seldom smoke our own cigars because we always go to cigar lounges. You have to buy one from a cigar lounge when you're there. So they're all just sitting there collecting age, but we keep buying more and more and we can't help it. Yeah, no, it's, that's part of the whole process. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, that keeps all the manufacturers happy as well. It's a fantastic yet wallet ripping hobby. Yeah, it, it certainly can be. Yeah. But, I can't even imagine how much it costs for you. Uh, no, no, it's stupid. Yeah. It's stupid money. Yeah. Like, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but how much a year do you think you average on cigars and whiskey? And whiskey? Or, yeah, cigars and liquor. Seven figures. Wow. <laughs> that's quite that's quite a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. Not through no no real, you know, if I, through, make my, my the stuff that I do sell, I, I get requested. I, I don't go out and market it. And that's why I still have so much because I haven't. I like seeing it just, you know, the bank gives you 1%. Yeah. This is the return on whiskey and cigars is better than just about any other business you can think of and has been for decades. So, you know, the, the collection that uh, was two years ago or a year, two years ago, let's say, worth a million bucks in uh, Cuban cigars is now worth probably about four million. Wow. Only because of the Chinese guy. Yeah. So I love the guy, really. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Can't stand him. He's making you a fortune. No, no, he's not a not a good person. But don't nobody likes what he did with the industry, and uh, and what's going on. But truth of the matter is, um, you know, in a lifetime, once in a while, a blind squirrel finds an acorn. So. so we should stop smoking our Davidoffs and stuff right now. <laughs> yes, you should. Yeah. Well, the, but the Dominican Davidoff, there's no, there's no real, you know, current legal U.S. cigars that have really, really um, become a great investment. Yeah. None. I, I want to say Opus, but that was only just a, a frenzy back, uh, you know, the late '90s and, and early 2000s when you were going to the retailers and trying to buy as many as you could because because you knew they aged well and you knew that people were paying second and tertiary market prices. Yeah. But uh, but in terms of there being a little black book where hey you should have invested in the Davidoff 2000s or the you know the whatever lines they have um, or or the Fuentes or uh, or any of the any of the major manufacturers yeah it's nothing like the Cubans man yeah I mean if the world goes in that direction it'll be crazy it yeah was. no no it's uh no but you know I think that the mindset of the the domestic manufacturers is much better than the, the Cubans just we're making the stuff to spread spread our passion and to just enjoy it, we're not trying to rip anybody off. We don't. We're not coming up with you know, fifty or five hundred dollar cigars, except for a few notables. But but uh, you can't take those guys too seriously. Um, and 
and uh, just uh, spread spread the the warmth and the passion. Yeah. Do you have a particular pairing that, let, let's say, you're celebrating something absolutely amazing, like a once in a lifetime event? What would be your highest end pairing that you would do? Oh, I would say a a bottle of one of my all time favorite pre uh, pre prohibition whiskeys with uh, pre embargo money money too. Well, money too still holding strong because they, they're still pretty good today no fabulous okay fabulous yes uh, that's my that's my go-to and i've been smoking pre pre-embargoes in 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000s uh my entire career yeah that's my go-to wow that's that's pretty cool if i get a new money crystal i'm excited number two like i can't imagine having an old one yeah they're, they just are so so full of finesse and cream and the draws you know i like a cigar to smoke me as opposed to me smoke a cigar i don't know whether you know what i mean by that but it's just like you bring it up to your lips and somehow it's just going in without any effort i don't like to work at smoking these the perfectly rolled Monty twos from you know up to the the mid 90s um they have a wide enough ring gauge so that you have a real good chance of not having any draw problems and most of them are a dream yeah. do you have do you have a certain ring gauge that you prefer over others torpedoes yeah and that's 50 52s you get bigger than that and then it's you know uh, telling a different story so you're not going to be jumping on the that new 10 by 100 cigar more than likely not. Yeah. <laughs> <I think so. laughs> yeah, what a schlong that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it looks like, and uh, that's a new trend. Like a lot of manufacturers uh, are coming out with. Uh, but I don't think they're that serious about it, and I don't think they're making you know a large volume of those things. Yeah. But as a novelty and as a well, you know, I've got one too. If you really want one, yeah. Yeah. Well, is there anything else we should ask you? before we wrap this up well, that would be a question for you to ask yourself <laughs> i know so little that i don't know what to ask at this point no no it's a, you know i can talk about we've talked about six different subjects when i think the original intent was just to talk about free embargoes so uh it's just uh if you're lucky enough to find them get a box share them with people and you'll get to for 10 people you get 10 different opinions and uh you get 10 different uh dreams they uh they invoke you know a different uh, uh different set of ideas and and uh thoughts of smoking while smoking uh, you know a cigar that's that old so if you wanted to get into collecting you know, vintage cigars and you've never done it before and you don't have your clout how would you do it? Look at the auctions. There's a few auctions uh, that uh, offer vintage cigars. Um, either that or... or uh, like a Sotheby's or... Yeah, Chris, well, Christie's... I started the Christie's auctions with James Suckling's collection and my collection back in the, the mid-90s. Um, and uh, they, they stopped when they realized that it took a lot of work and they could sell one painting for 10 million while 500 lots of cigars was only bringing them 5 million <laughs> so that didn't that's last. all but, but um <coughs> sorry no worries but um there's a uh, a couple in hong kong and uh christie's um started back up in hong kong um and so i think sotheby's does a few and uh, then there's uh, Mitchell Orchant that's in London who really has the, the best game in town um, called Seagars. And that's a, and he, I, I buy and sell on his site. I mean, both ways. Yeah. You know, it's very, very interesting. It's, and, and it's education. You can actually learn by going on, on there. He does them every, I think every six months. What's the website? C.gars.com. 
Excellent. I'll, I'll be checking that out tonight. Yeah, he's a rock star. We started bidding together against each other um, at the Christie's auctions, and so I, we've known each other for. And a lot of the other guys that were going to those auctions, they're all refined guys. They all have big collections now. <laughs> we used to, you know, bid each other up and and uh, always go smoke and drink afterwards. So that was, everybody would converge in London, but now it's only online. He stopped doing the the uh, in person stuff years ago. That's absolutely fantastic. That's, that's probably the best way to get an idea what the what the market values are, and to see whether you have the the scratch um, to uh, jump in the game and buy buy. Actually, you can buy singles. You know, you can spend five hundred bucks and get a half a dozen singles of really good cigars. So that would be the way to scratch the surface. That actually sounds like a pretty reasonable barrier to entry. Right. Yeah. yeah. No. So it's it's not for the stratosphere. Yeah. You don't need to be a billy boy. <laughs> well, I really appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time to share your passion with us. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Enjoy it.